uh, as always, uh, don't just watch me do this. Please follow along with me. In this case, we'll be working with this data file, uh, the VWPSM Excel file. This is actually data about Nike running shoes. It's some data that uh, some students in my marketing research class collected several years ago, but it ended up being very useful as an example for uh, the Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter. So uh, make sure you downloaded that and open up uh, a copy of that document. And when you first open this file, it, it probably will open to this uh, first worksheet, the one that says VW data. Now this data file, this is like from Qualtrics. So if you've worked with any Qualtrics uh, surveys before, uh, like these IDs will probably look kind of familiar to you. This is like a, a typical um, respondent ID that you get out of Qualtrics. There's a variable in here called run. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And run was something that um, that we just collected at the time to see, are they runners or not? You know, do you run on a regular basis for exercise versus you don't? With the idea that some people might just be buying their running shoes because they like how they look or they like that they're comfortable, but not for performance reasons. And I think the hypothesis was that avid runners would be willing to pay more for a good running shoe. It turns out we didn't have enough uh, non-runners in the sample to do anything with it, but that variable is in there. Uh, and I leave it in there just to indicate to you that the, the Van Westendorp is not just necessarily going to be limited to these four questions. That's what it's based on. But in theory, you could have subpopulations. In this case, it would be like runners versus non-runners. And you could do two separate Van Westendorp price sensitivity meters and then see, like, do the ranges overlap? Like, if they overlap, then you can maybe market the, the, pro the same product to the two groups at a similar price, right? Whereas if they have very different perceptions, maybe you need to have two separate products. So the Van Westendorp can help you sort of at an exploratory level with questions like that. As far as we're concerned, we're not going to do anything with that run variable. So you can ignore it. These four variables are the ones we talked about in the last video, right? So we have the question about at what price is it too expensive? At what price is it too cheap? In other words, so cheap that you don't believe that the quality could be any good. Uh, at what price is it expensive where you'd still buy it? but uh, you'd have to think about it. And then at what price would you consider it cheap in a good way? In other words, at what price would you say it's a good value or a bargain? Now, the data as presented here are in a format that's basically what you would get out of Qualtrics. You would field a survey, you would ask these four questions, and you would get a data file where each row represents the responses of one person, one respondent. And they would have four columns of data, one for each question. So in this case, this respondent, R underscore Q, B, O, L, M, et cetera, gave these four answers to this question saying, uh, 250 would be too expensive, 20 is too cheap, 175 is expensive, but not too expensive, and 75 is cheap, but not too cheap. So you end up with one row per respondent. And if we scroll down through this file, you'll see that we have 100, it's actually 115 because we had a header row, right? So there are 115 respondents to this study. And so we have 115 rows of data. Now we're gonna want to create a frequency table using uh, pivot tables. However, you can't do it uh, with respondent level data. This data actually needs to be um, reformatted into something known as a stacked file. I'm not going to require you to convert the data files. This is the type of thing that if you're doing the analytics frequently, you know, like at a firm, there would be a separate division or a separate team that would be responsible for data preparation, data management, and that sort of thing. And so you could request from the data people, hey, give me the file in a different format. And in this case, you'd say, can you convert this uh, respondent level file into a stacked data file? So for our purposes, Let's just assume that there was a data team that could do that. Uh, so when you see this file, it, it, it looks a little bit different, right? So we still have the run variable. And actually, like, you know, just to emphasize, I could delete that. I don't need that. I don't need that uh, column. I'm not using it for anything. Now, remember before we had the four questions. So one respondent, four questions. Now you're seeing here, you've got one column with all the prices and then a separate column that tells you, well, what was that price? Let me just show it to you real quick to give you a sense of what this means to stack it. Here's my respondent level file. And so I've got the 115 respondents in the order that they answered the survey. And so I've got, let's just look at these first few. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we'll go one more. Ten. The first ten answers, right? So if you look at the stacked file, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the first, the same first ten answers from the same ten respondents. But we don't just have ten, we've got the full 115. If I scroll down, you'll see here after 115, then we get the same 10 again here with their answers for too cheap. And if you look here, too cheap, 20, 25, 35. So basically what I'm doing is this. I'm taking, I'm going to shorten this up even a little bit more. I'm taking these five and I'm taking these five. I'll see that's too cheap. And I can take these five. Right. Except, again, we've done it with the full 115, not just five. But basically what I've done here is I've taken the first five records and I've stacked them, literally stacked them. I put one on top of the other, right? And so instead of having four columns of data, I have all the prices in one column, but with a second column that tells you, well, what does that price mean in this row? So that's what it means to stack a data file. And I, I just want to show you that so that you understand where that term comes from and it makes sense. Like what the heck does that mean to stack a data file? But no, this file has the same information as this file. Respondent level, stack data file, same information, different format. But when you want to create a um, pivot table from this data to do your uh, Van Westendorp, you have to do it from the stack data file. Okay, we're here. Stack data file. There's a version here that says stacked sorted by ID. It's the same data, just stacked or sorted differently. So you can see here the same respondent is in the file four times with the four questions. Same respondent four times answered the four questions. Same respondent four times answered the four questions. So that one again, it's really presented there just to give you a sense of like how the data formats are related to each other and what they mean and what's in there. Now you could create the Van Westendorp table from either version of stack, it doesn't matter. But I'll go back to the, the, you know, the first one I showed you. This part should look familiar. Click anywhere in the table. We're gonna go to insert pivot table. And we will just you know, keep the defaults. We'll create the pivot table in a uh, new worksheet. And there's not a lot going on here. I even deleted out the run variable. So even that's not in here. We just have price and we have question. That's it. I'm going to drag price into the rows. And then I'm going to drag price into the values. And it's going to start off as sum of price. I want to change that in the value field settings to count. I want the count of price. So what is this exactly? What does this mean? For each question, we ask the respondents, well, how much, you know, at what price is it this? At what price is it that? So this tells us, for example, that $5 was mentioned three times. Might have been mentioned by three different people, might have been mentioned multiple times by some, actually it shouldn't, if you've got your data validation in there properly, they shouldn't be able to give the same price multiple times. But it, you know, in theory, that could happen if you haven't programmed the survey so that it's not allowed to happen. But let's, let's for the sake of argument, say that we did program it right and that there aren't any problems like that. So that means that $5 was mentioned three times, that uh, $45 was mentioned 12 times, that $60 was mentioned 35 times. And that's across all four questions, right? So one person might have said $5 was too cheap, another person might have said it was cheap. $60, someone might have said that was expensive, someone else might have said that was cheap, someone else might have said that was too expensive, right? So, but it was mentioned somewhere by someone. We can't do a whole lot with this column by itself. And the counts add up to 460. Remember, we had 115 respondents, and they, there were four prices they were asked for. So four times 115, that's where the 460 comes from. What we actually want to see, though, is what are the counts for each price point by question type, like, by, like what they were asked. Like, was it cheap, too cheap, expensive, or too expensive? So to do that, we're going to grab question and drag it into the columns. 
And so this now becomes our new pivot table. And you can see here, 115, 115, 115. We have 115 responses to each question because we had 115 respondents. And you'll see that you don't have anybody answering the, the, the low prices in anything other than too cheap at first, right? Um, that, that's the price which people go like, oh, $5 shoes, that can't be any good. Then you get the cheap values, then you get the expensive values, then the two expensive values. But there's a lot of overlap because different people have different price sensitivities. This initial table that we create here is known as a frequency table. So I'll just label, that's the frequencies. And these are, these are dollar figures here. Now what you're gonna need to do, which might seem a little strange the first time through, is we're going to create three templates because we have to create additional tables that they're all gonna relate back to this frequency table. Also, when you're clicking in the table, make sure under pivot table analyze, Make sure that generate get pivot data is unchecked. Again, if you have that checked, you're going to have problems. So make sure that's unchecked. Okay. I'm going to copy this column. And actually, I'm going to, where it says count of price row labels, I want to keep that clear. I don't want to have anything above that column because these are actually going to be our axes points. And I don't even need grand total here. I'm going to clear that out. Like these are going to be the labels on a chart. And they're important, but we want to make sure, the reason I leave this blank is I don't want Excel to mistake it for, for data. That's not data, those are axis points, those are labels. Then I'm gonna take these values, cheap, expensive, too cheap, and too expensive, and I'm gonna copy them over here because I'm gonna create another version or another table based on the frequency table. Once I have that, and be careful with the grand total. You don't need a grand total. It's just going to be four, the prices and then four columns of data. So I'm highlighting all this. I'm hitting control C if you're on your Mac, command C. And then I'm going to paste multiple versions of it over here. And then I'm going to fill them in. Okay. So this is my frequency table. The next step is to create what's known as a cumulative frequency table. And I might go a little fast now because I'm, I started drinking my coffee. <laughs> um, but always remember with the video, pause it, rewind. You're in total control of the pace. So I'll try to talk a little bit slower, but it's hard when I start drinking coffee. What do we need to do in the cumulative frequency table? In the first row, the cumulative frequency and the frequency are the same. You could, in theory, just copy this and paste it here. Because the first row is the same. You haven't accumulated anything yet in the first row. But what I typically like to do is I'll just type equals here. In this case, it's in cell I5. And I want to copy the value that's in cell B5. And again, this is a phrase that you'll hear me use uh, over and over again in this video. And I mentioned it in one of the earlier videos. I'm going to point to the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. All right, so B5 is in the same place in the frequency table that I5 is in the cumulative frequency table. This is a floating reference because we're gonna copy that. So I'm doing control C again, and then I'm control Ving over uh, to these, but you could do it with your mouse as well. And you, you can see that the blanks from the pivot table are interpreted as zeros. So that takes care of itself. I'm double clicking on these, uh, these the column, um, or the cell widths, just to expand it. So that's the formula for the first row. That's the only row that has that formula. In the second row, we need to begin accumulating the counts, right? So we're adding it up. What are we adding together? Well, at the $10 price point in the cumulative frequency table, I wanna know how many people have said that that is cheap up to that price point. Well, that will include whoever said $5. So in cell I6, I'm gonna type the equal sign. I'm gonna to point to the cell directly above it, which is my sum up to that point, the people who said $5, plus the value in the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. So I want the sum up to that point plus the new row. And so Excel is highlighting for you here. In this case, that would be I5 plus B6. 
floating references again. So if I copy this, I'll use the mouse this time, right click copy, highlight over and paste, paste the, you know, the, the actual the regular paste, not values or anything like that. So these are all still zeros. So it's hard to see what's going on, but let's look in the two chief column. This is now K5, the value above, plus D6, the value in the corresponding cell in the adjacent table, right? So it's how many people said $10 was too cheap plus how many people said $5 was too cheap is up to that point, the cumulative amount that have said too cheap up to that point. So hopefully that makes sense. The nice thing is once we have the formulas in the second row, Highlight, copy, paste all the way through. Those formulas should properly calculate the accumulated amount or the cumulative amount for each question up to each price point. So you can see here, like if we look at column I, the cheap column at $75, there were 79 people who said $75 or less was cheap, right? There were 10 people who said $70 was expensive, like $70 or less was expensive. And as a quality control step, this is always good to double check, keeping in mind there were 115 respondents, we saw that here, your cumulative uh, values should total up to that total, in this case 115, in the final row. All, all four columns should total up to 115 in that final, final row. If one of these doesn't add up or you have an amount greater than 115, something went wrong. Common mistake is that you know the counts are, you, you've got some here instead of count. So like watch out for that sort of thing, but that's always a good point to, to catch your mistakes. Okay, so that's our cumulative frequency table. We started with a pivot table to create frequency. We move on to uh, a cumulative frequency table um, based on that frequency table. So I'm going to take a break here and we'll pick up in part two uh, of the walkthrough in the, um, in the next video.